as I said, I'm Patrick McKeever. I'm from UNESCO Paris, and I'm Secretary of the International Geoscience and Geoparks Program. And what I want to do this morning is really to give you a very good, very thorough introduction into what a UNESCO Global Geopark really is, and hopefully you'll understand what it is and also what it's not. Um, I think most of you know that UNESCO is the United Nations Education, Science and Cultural Organization. But I suppose we're known mostly for the site designations. If you ask the general public, what do you know about UNESCO? Most of them are likely to say World Heritage Sites. And we have almost 1,100 World Heritage Sites now across almost every country in the world, really. Um, and we also have almost 670 biosphere reserves. Now the thing to remember about these two labels is these are quite old designations. The biosphere is dated in 1971, and World Heritage, the World Heritage Convention was signed in 1972. So the ideas behind these designations, the ideas behind the protection of, of, of site, is very much rooted in 20th century thinking at that time of what they thought was important in terms of protecting sites. The concept of sustainable development, community involvement, but while it is in the biosphere program, at that time was very innovative, it is not part of the World Heritage Convention whatsoever. It's so about protection. By contrast, UNESCO Global Geoparks we created just two and a half years ago, and this is very much 21st century thinking about conservation. It's very much about making sure that the people who live at these sites are actually at the center of what was all. The site is there for their benefit, and they must be involved. Of course, we do have places across the world that have several of the labels. This is a photograph of uh, Mount Pico. It's the highest mountain in Portugal. It's on the Azor Island in the middle of the ocean. The Azores are nine islands, one UNESCO World Geopark, four biosphere reserves, and two World Heritage Sites. So a very special place to go and visit if ever you get the chance. Now, I heard in the questions and answers uh, there just when I came in talking about biosphere reserves and core areas and buffer zones and transition zones, forget it with geoparks. Don't exist. A geopark is a single unified territory. It has no core zone, it has no periphery, nothing like that. It's a single united territory where sites and landscapes of international geological value. So it's a geology, geological science that has a great international importance. But all these things are managed in a holistic concept of protection, education, and sustainable development. So this is not just about geology. Try to think of the geo and geopark as coming from Gaia, the great uh, goddess of the earth. And that's really what the concept is about. It's about showing our, our geological heritage, our geodiversity controls our biodiversity, that the special landscapes, the special mountains, special rocks can also control our intangible heritage, they give rise to folklore, to, to local tales, to, to ancient values, they determine how we farm. So in a way, a geopark brings together geological heritage, natural heritage, cultural heritage, and intangible heritage. And together, that's the geopark. Now this is a photograph from Changjiajie in, in China, and you can see that this is a very, very tall pillar of rock. Right on the top they have a glass walkway right across, so unless you have a very good head for heights, uh, you may not want to visit this, but it's very spectacular, really very spectacular. <coughs> One other fundamental difference between the other two UNESCO designations and geoparks is networking. Of course there are networks within the within the MAP program, but they're nothing like what goes on in the geoparks. For example, this is a photograph of the UNESCO Global Geoparks in Europe, meeting last year. They come together twice every year, representatives of all of the 73 uh, geoparks in Europe, they meet twice a year. These are not and necessarily managers meet together, they're not geologists. These are the people of the geoparks themselves, coming together to learn from each other, 
to share experience, to form common projects with each other. It's this concept of networking that's fundamental to geoparks. And even in the operational guidelines that UNESCO has, it states that it is compulsory for every UNESCO Global Geopark to be part of the Global Geoparks Network and to work with other geoparks. So this is not an optional extra. This is one of your core responsibilities. So we have the way the Global Geoparks work, as, as I'm sure Nick was pointed out, is through regional networks. We have the European Geoparks Network, we have the Asia Pacific Geoparks Network, and uh, we also have the GEOLAG, the uh, Geopark Network of Latin America and the Caribbean. So what's really special? What differentiates geoparks from, say, biospheres or world heritage? Well, geoparks, of course, have rocks and landscapes. And as a geologist, I can tell you that what's special about a rock is that a rock contains something very precious. Maybe gold, maybe diamond. But even more precious than that, it contains a bit of the memory of our planet. And as a geologist, I can read the rock and therefore I can read the memory of the Earth itself. And that's what's special about geoparks. They tell the story of the Earth, the story that's 4,600 million years old. Now you can imagine through that span of time, the climate has changed on Earth dramatically, from times when there was no ice at either polar cap, to times when the entire planet was covered in ice. Can you imagine how, how bizarre that was? Whole planet Case so therefore, geoparks have a very important role to work with local communities in discussing present day challenges regarding climate change and to see how uh, communities can mitigate for that and prepare for that. Many of our geoparks, of course, are in tectonically active areas of the world, such as we have here in Japan and in Indonesia. And uh, one of the roles that you would see in many geoparks today, and you know, I see some of the leaflets down here uh, talking about them, is to prepare local communities for geological hazards, such as uh, earthquakes or any of tsunami. This is a photograph that was taken just last year. Every year we run a, uh, an, inter an intensive course in geoparks from Lesbos Island in Greece. Uh, uh, and, and ourselves in UNESCO to organize that. And on the first day of the course last year, it was a uh, six earthquake struck the island. 6.6 6. 6. 6 hit, the, hit the island and sort of terrified these people on the course. And while there was no damage where the course was happening, two villages were very badly hit. And this is the school in one of those villages the day after the earthquake. Now the children of this school, just one week earlier, had done an earthquake awareness training organised by the Geopark. And once the ground started to shake, every kid in the school knew exactly what to do. And they all got out. No one was injured. And we met the teachers the next day and they were so grateful. They were crying, full of emotion. That the geopark has done that. So this is one of the very important roles geoparks have to play in the community. You know, until I arrived in UNESCO, nobody would talk about mining, and nobody would talk about extraction. It was a bad thing. It was dirty. You know, they didn't want to know. Um, but of course, many of our geoparks are former mining areas, uh, areas that have been shaped by mining by the industry, and these are special areas. And communities, geologists will know that. The mining communities are very special, very resilient people. And so it's through the geoparks that are trying to really remind communities about that, remind them that they're, they're from a special area also, and that they should celebrate their mining heritage. And many of them do. We see some examples of that. But this is the real important slide. Geoparks are people. As I mentioned, it's not just about geology, but this is what it's about. You know, you hear other things are involved with local people, but the geoparks really take this involvement to, to a different level. The geopark, uh, the people of the geopark are really the managers. They're involved in it. We call them geopark ambassadors. Many of the local people will want to wish to be trained 
to become tour guides, they want to, to have help to open up maybe restaurants, accommodation provision. And it's this sense about building community ownership, community empowerment, community sense of pride, which is really uh, at the heart of the Geopark philosophy. We can see these ladies here with the Geopark Ranger on the, on the back. These are tour guides from a Geopark in Portugal, but these are local residents. And because they can bring tourists around their own area, share the stories and the history of their area that they know better than anyone else, of course tourists will be willing to pay a little bit extra money to have that really genuine uh, experience. And of course that's one of the reasons that, that we do that. So this is really about trying to, to build inclusive, sustainable, regional development strategies in geoparks. As, as Nicholas mentioned, try not to think of uh, UNESCO Global Geopark as a designation. Try to think of it as a promotional brand of economic development, as a label that's given to an area because of the type of the model of economic development that it's using. And here we see some examples. This is an aspiring geopark in Madura in Ecuador. This is high up in the Andes. These are the Quechua people. So these are people who, who have lived in these mountains long before the Inca came to this part of South America. And these people have their own stories about the volcanoes that surround them. Stories that are, are so different to what, we, what I as a geologist would know in, 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 in their culture. The volcanoes are male and female, and they have stories to explain all this. And so what we want to do is we want them to share those stories with visitors coming in. And of course we want them to share the scientific stories as well, to bring them together so that both are valued. And here you can see them making up the handcrafts, which they also sell uh, as part of the geopark. This is a volcano meister from Toyobusu who's a school teacher, and we see one of the, the leaflets down here about the Volcano Meisters uh, in Japan. Uh, her job is to explain uh, about the sudden eruption of the volcano there some 16, 17 years ago, but also to, to tell the local people what they should do if this volcano should start erupting again. And I should say that uh, the volcano uh, erupted without any warning, so uh, some spectacular imagery of that day. This is a, 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 a geopark in Europe. It's a former copper mining area called the Copper Coast. This building, uh, 10 years ago, was completely derelict. It was just a ruin. And through the geopark, the people were able to raise money themselves. They didn't get help from local government. They didn't get help from national government. They did it themselves through various fundraising activities. We were able to raise enough money to renovate this building and it's now the centre of this local community. You can see here the local musicians playing traditional music. They have all sorts of uh, fairs that happen, like a craft fair, Christmas market, this sort of thing. But it's also uh, the tourism information centre for this area. And it's become so successful that the Prime Minister of the country even came down to see what they had done with it. made such a big, a big uh, story in, in Ireland. This is the Copper Coast. This is an aspiring geopark called Maringo. It's in Kenya, in Africa. And this is, a, this is actually a photograph of me under the tree, talking to the local men and women about what a geopark is. These, these people asked, uh, asked me to come out to talk to them about the they heard about the geopark, they heard about sustainable tourism, economic development, and they really wanted to have first-hand information and it was very interesting for me because these people were asking really hard questions. <laughs> really tough, like, who are we asking? Why would we want this? What would it be to us? This is really what we want. Because we don't want people just taking the name Geopark because it's associated with the UNESCO. We want them to take it because they want it, because they know that it could make a difference to them. This is, this is the important, really the important thing. I'm happy to say that this project is my own idea. Communicating geoscientists, of course, as a, as a geologist, that's very important to me, to, to make sure that the story of the Earth is, is given over as part of the geoparks. 
And normally, of course, as a geologist, I might give you a lecture, or I might take you out on a field trip or something like this. But there are more, uh, there are other ways of doing this, and there are other ways of, um, of bringing these stories to, to local people. So, this is Moruto. Um, anybody from Moruto here? Yeah, so this was a few years ago in Moruto. And uh, this is, well, you probably know where this is. And these are some of the local school children uh, hearing about the geological heritage of the area. But actually, what was being explained to them was the process of sea floor uplift during an earthquake, which then displaces a large body of water, which comes on shore as a tsunami. So this is what was being explained to them. Tsunami had hit this area before. Tsunami will hit this area again. So it's important that the people understand why that happens, and when it does happen, where they need to go to. So this is all part of uh, the work that's done in Naruto. This is a, 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 another geopark guide, a local person from um, Uruguay in South America. This area became a geopark just uh, six years ago. And before it was a geopark, this area was really pretty unknown in Uruguay. And it's now one of the top tourist attractions. The whole area has been economically transformed. And it's been transformed in a way that's entirely sustainable. It's been transformed by the work of the local people. So even if politics change in the area, the local people are still there controlling everything. And indeed, they're going to host a major workshop in November for South America uh, so that they can show what they've done and other people can learn how, how they did it and maybe do something similar themselves. Protecting the geology, of course, is very important. We have uh, we do have some geological sites, of course, on the World Heritage List, but, but not so many. And so geoparks are an alternative mechanism to protect some of the sites. But as you can expect in geoparks, we, we like to do it a little bit differently. So this is a Zigong, UNESCO Public Geopark in China. And this is a, a fossil of a dinosaur, exactly where Mother Nature intended it to be. It has not been taken out of the ground, reconstructed, and brought to a museum in Beijing. It just kept it there, as, as, as I say, as nature intended, so people can understand what happened to this animal. They can see it lying there and it makes them think, well, how did it get there? How was it preserved? So it's a much more informative way of, of dealing with, with fossils. And we see examples like this where, where they've built a museum over the fossil. We see this in many of the geoparks uh, across the world. This is Nicholas's uh, geopark in, in Lesbos. Uh, they were building a new road, or they are building a new road out to one of the, out to the museum western side of the island. And as they were building the road, they uncovered many fossil tree trunks. You can see them here in Kingston White. And rather than just destroy them and you know, push them out of the way, of course, the, the geopark meticulously uh, logged everything, noted everything, preserved everything. So this, this is also important work within, within geoparks. And education, children are very important. And it's not just education on children. It's education at all levels. That all of the geoparks should have education courses for, for young children, for older children. They should work with universities. They should also offer um, adult education for those who are interested to learn about the area, to learn about the earth. This is uh, back in Uruguay again. And uh, these three boys dressed in white. This is the school uniform. And uh, this school had to do a project on what geoparks are as part of their evaluation process. And uh, they made a presentation, just like I'm doing now, but in the audience were three government ministers, the Minister of Economic Development, the Minister of Tourism, and the Minister of Education. And if those ministers were in the room today, I would be very nervous talking to you. But these three boys, no nervous whatsoever because they were so proud of being able to tell these ministers about their area, about this special part of Uruguay. It was very, very emotional, very, very nice. And this is a group of school children from Hong Kong. 
and they're uh, about 14, 15 year old, and they're just about to set off to go on an exchange visit to one of the geoparks in Japan. I can't remember which, which one it was. Um, but this is also part of the work that's very important, is to, is to bring the children of the different geoparks together as well. I know that some of the, in Europe, some of them do it by Skype, and they have Skype calls with each other. But here we can see that between uh, Hong Kong and mainland China and Japan, we now have quite a, quite a very good uh, school exchange system, which of course is very important because it helps children from different cultural backgrounds learn about each other and have respect for each other. So this is also, of course, a very important part of, of anything that UNESCO should be involved in. Many uh, geo, geo parks also involve the arts community. Now what you see here is a cone made by a very famous uh, sculptor called Andy Goldsworthy. He has bits of art, for example, in the Smithsonian and Washington, D.C. But he also has one here at a geo park in France. And what you see behind him are layers of rock that are now vertical. Of course, every geologist know that it would have started out not vertical but horizontal. In fact, it would have started out as a sea, as a the bed of the sea, millions of years ago. Then tectonic forces would have affected them, and might have been put upright vertical, and they're about a thousand and a half meters up in the Alps in southern France. And the sculptor Andy just thought this was just one of the most amazing things he had ever heard of that something could that that sort of thing could happen. And so, rather than put an information board where people can stand and read. He just wanted to put a bit of art to make people stop and think for themselves. How did this happen? Where did it happen? What forces could have done this? So it's a nice innovative way of, of, of doing things. This is another, this may not look like the most spectacular bridge you've ever seen in your life, but this is really something very special because this is in Rakianas in Iceland. And on the left hand side is North America. Right hand side is Europe. Of course, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but for the tourists, they like very much, they like it very much to walk from one continent across to the other to see their doom there. And of course, although it's the story, the real story is much more complex, it's a, it does bring that process of pick tectonics, of the fact that the Earth's constantly moving, it brings it to a whole new range of, of people who really didn't understand these processes before. Supporting local enterprise, we've talked a lot, I'm sure Nicholas talked a lot about economic development, sustainable development. But what are we actually talking about? This is a, a women's cooperative again on, on Lesos and Nicholas's Jew Park. And here we have several women's cooperatives which uh, started off producing local food products for sale to tourists. It's become very successful, so they've moved actually into accommodation provision line for tourists as well. It's a very, very successful. And we have women's cooperatives in many other parts of the world as well. And, uh, for those, most of you are from National Commission, so you know that gender equality is one of UNESCO's uh, priority areas. And this is a, a women's cooperative from the Hesham Island, UNESCO Global Geo Park in Iran. Uh, well, some of us were there just uh, three or four weeks ago. And we were in this, 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 this shop, this is one of many, where, where the ladies still keep the traditional uh, costume, but now sell it to tourists. And, and in this particular village, they just don't have uh, uh, places selling crafts. Again, they offer accommodation. So you can actually have a homestay visit in an Iranian home, have the Iranian food, experience all of that. It's a, really a fantastic, fantastic, uh, experience to do and um, very, 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 I mean, the, the women, one of the women who, who runs a restaurant was very thankful that the GFR had enabled her to do, had to, to do that and she's now running a very successful business on her own. Um, there are other innovative things as well, I'm going back to my own country, this is Ireland, this is a uh, halfway down the west Atlantic coast of Ireland, you can see the president of the Geoparks Network and the 
chairman of the UNESCO Global Geoparks Council here beside the, the sign that welcomes you into, into this geopark. But there is one thing I want to talk about. They have many activities in this geopark, but this is something called the food trail. Now many geoparks are developing these. This is basically a trail that tourists can follow, whether by car or by bicycle or whatever they really want to do. And they're going from one local food producer to another and sampling the different products, buying the different products that they, they might have. In this geopark, they don't have just one food trail, they've got five. And you can see the five leaflets here at the bottom. Um, there's one farm to fork, so this is where you can try some of the local lamb, some of the local beef. Uh, they have a cheese trail uh, because artisanal cheeses are very popular now in, in Europe. They have a nature's child trail, so this is where you can go from anything. Uh, you can see ice cream being, being made there, things like that. They have a market garden, so that would be vegetables. And then the final one is the ocean trail, where you can go around different fisheries, uh, sample the wild Atlantic salmon, uh, trout, and stuff like that. And I should say that uh, some of the places on this food trail, one of them on the ocean trail, the Burn Smokehouse, now sells their product in Harrods in London, and it's labeled as product of the Geopark. And another one recently got a, 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 it was the first pub, and our first Irish pub in Ireland to be awarded a mission star for the quality of its food. So we were very proud of that, the first pub we did that. And this is some of the food that uh, the Geoparks themselves tasted last year at that meeting in, in this Geopark. And they were, um, I think, very well impressed uh, by, by what they found there. So many other geoparks, which is the year I'm talking about, are, are now doing food trails as, as well. This is a, this is, listen, it's not a UNESCO Global Geopark, but I hope this year it will be one. It's, a, it's a, an aspiring geopark from Peru. And I'm showing this because I think this is one of the best examples of supporting youth enterprise that I've seen. Uh, in my years going around geoparks. This is a centre in Peru in Africa for very disadvantaged children. These children come from the poorest, most disadvantaged villages in this area of Peru. And here they're brought to the residential centre, so, so they live here and they're fed here, and they learn different skills that will prepare them for, for the future. Here they're learning how to work with stone, so one of the interesting things is that all of the interpretive signs in this geopark are going to be made by these kids. Uh, rather than use wood or plastic, they're going to use stone interpretive boards, and they're, going to, they're, they're making them. Here they're learning about the rich archaeology of the area as well. And this is one of the most successful. So here the, the children are learning about how to care uh, in hotels, in restaurants, how, how you actually can do that, how to prepare large amounts of food for visitors, how to serve people at tables, how to serve the nuclear drink, how to bring the food to the table. And it's been so successful that all, all, the, all, the, uh, all these uh, young people get jobs after this and stay in the area, which means that the economic benefit is, is coming to the area and the whole thing is improving. So this is very much in line with uh, of bringing benefit to the people. Uh, another way that we uh, support local enterprise is to actually make them partners, official partners of the Geopark. This is uh, back in Iceland, this is Katla. And um, this mountain behind, that you can see behind the farm, is, is, for, is very famous, it's called Ayafjallajökull. It erupted eight years ago, and as a result of the eruption, it, stopped every plane in Europe flying for I think about two weeks so I'm sure you've all heard about that but while many people were annoyed that they couldn't get their flights the people in this farm you can guess how they felt when the ice started to descend, descend on top of them and this is what it was like at the time and the farm was eventually completely covered in ice from, from the volcano and they thought, what, what are we going to do? How can we ever recover from this? We spent our, all our lives farming. And in Iceland, it's a very harsh climate. They've spent all their lives, and now everything's destroyed. 
But through the help of the local community, they managed to, to clear the ash off the land in a bizarre twist of fate. The ash actually acted as something like a fertilizer for the soil, and they came back even stronger than before. But through all of this process, they made a video. And that video is now shown in this Ayat Kiat Visitor Center. Just a few kilometers away is another exhibition about the volcanoes of Iceland. Uh, this center cost, I think, about 30 million US dollars. And that was put in by the Icelandic government and by a private enterprise. And they are now, uh, it tells the story of all the different volcanoes of Iceland. But they have this nice plaque recent UNESCO logo, which shows that they're an official partner of the Catholic UNESCO Group of Geopark. So a certain amount of the profits of this center goes back into the community, goes back into the Geopark to help the uh, community enterprise. It's the same in the other Icelandic Geopark. This is the airport hotel. Iceland has one international airport. And they have a hotel, and that hotel Again, it's an official partner of the Geopark. They have the plaque to show that. And of course, that means that some the profit of the hotel is going in to support uh, enterprise in the Geopark. So that's what a Geopark is. This is now how you can become one. So there is an application process, maybe from the NAFCOM, you'll be familiar with uh, making a nomination for World Heritage. So the process is something similar to that. Uh, one year ahead of an application, I, will, I have to receive from you a letter of intent. A letter that says, later this year, we are going to apply to become a UNESCO group of Geo Park. So for example, just two days ago, I received one from uh, one of your neighbor countries here. Not South Korea, the other one. So they're going to be applying this year. Uh, the application we only accept during the months of October and November. And there's a very precise format. I think it is in one of your folders, the format that you have to follow. There's a section A, B, C, D, and E. You absolutely must follow that format. So, so that allows us to treat every country exactly the same. Um, what happens is that when you submit the dossier to me, then on 1st of December, I'll look through the dossier and check that it's in the right format. If there's anything missing, anything not right, then I'll let you know and give you about two months to resubmit. We then put a summary of your application onto UNESCO's website for three months. Now, we call this an intergovernmental check because we've noticed that, uh, especially in World Heritage, that politics can come into the decision making right at the end of the process during the World Heritage meetings, the committee meetings every year. So in Geoparks, we decided to get anything like that done right at the start. And if any country has um, uh, some objection to make, you do it right at the start during this three-month period. And if we receive an objection from a country, then we will stop the application immediately and tell the two countries concerned, if you're a problem, you sort it out. The NESP is not getting involved in it. You sort it out. The first year we had this process, we had such a problem, and the countries quickly got the message, sorted out the problem, we haven't had anything since, I hope it says that way. Well. The geology of the, ge the Geopark, I talked about the fact it had to have international value. So we asked the International Union of Geological Sciences, they have been our partner in ITCP, International Geoscience Program, since 1972. So we asked them, through their pool of experts across the world to, to find out does the area have international value or not. If everything is then okay, we send a, an evaluation mission between May the 15th and August the 15th. So this is for two people will go to your area, spend three or four days in your area, checking everything, meeting the local people, checking that you really are working as a geopark, that it's not just an aspirational thing. And then they make a report which is distributed to the UNESCO Global Geoparks Council and they meet every September. And they can either accept the application, defer the application for a maximum of two years, or reject. And then if they accept, 
those the applications that are accepted by the council then go to UNESCO's executive board for endorsement. So this is the official UNESCO staff, I suppose. Now, in case your applying geopark includes a word heritage site or it might overlap or indeed include a biosphere reserve, that's not necessarily a problem. But we will want to know, but if you already have one UNESCO label, why do you need another? Why, why do you want a geopark if you're a biosphere or if you're a word heritage? So you have to submit as part of your dossier the reason that you want the geopark label. We'll also want to see a letter of support from the management of the other designation. And we want to see a plan of action about how you're going to avoid confusion, um, how you're going to uh, make sure that you're working together and not duplicating each other. So, so it's quite a serious thing that we take quite seriously. We don't necessarily want to have overlapping designations to be honest with you. Now this is the other steam the tail, which is again very really different to World Heritage and Biosphere Reserve because we only give the labor geopark for four years. And after the four years you have to go through what's called revalidation. Now I know in World Heritage and that they call it periodic review. This is something a lot a lot uh, more serious than that, a lot stricter. Because this involves the submission of a very detailed progress report. A very detailed Excel spreadsheet, which we call the self-evaluation. The self-evaluation form is really a SWOT analysis, and it tries to analyze how you have improved over the four years. What have you done in terms of sustainable tourism? What have you done in terms of education? What have you done in terms of economic development? So we try to track this thing. And again, we send two people back to your area every four years. I know that Saini Gagan will have this process this, this summer, that two people are going to go to Saini Gagan and do this big check. The result of it is discussed by the council again, and the result here, we call it green, yellow and red. What does green, yellow and red actually mean? Well, green means that you've got, if you like, a green light, that yes, everything's going along as it should be, and we will renew the label geopark for another four years, after which you have to do this again. But if we find that there's a problem, something's not wrong, maybe you're not talking to the other geoparks the way you should, maybe there's some problem inside the, the management, then we'll flag up a little yellow card and go, hold on, there's a problem here. You've got two years to sort it out, and you only get the label geopark for two more years, and then we send two people back. And if they find that the problem's still there, that something else has happened, the whole thing's even got worse, then we will deem the quality of what you're doing is actually dropped below the level of quality we expect in the UNESCO Global Geopark, and we take the designation off you, so you become delisted, the red card. Um, also, the council has the right to give a red card to a geopark for any reason if they uh, maybe cannot do the revalidation, or if there is breach of the guidelines, a serious breach of the guidelines can be instant delisting. So I know that my, my colleagues in the World Heritage Centre are really a little bit jealous of this process because they didn't build it into the convention and it's really quite hard to, to delist a World Heritage Centre I don't know if once or twice that has happened. One thing to bear in mind that during the application process, revalidation process, it's up to the geopark to pay for the cost. So the geopark has to pay for the two people to travel and to, for their accommodation, etc. while they're there. There's no professional fee or something like that. But every geopark has to do this, so the system is really quite fair in, in the end. So this is a photograph of the council from, from last year. Uh, they met in China, in Xishindong, and they approved this list of areas, including Sutun in Thailand, here we are in the room. And uh, uh, these were all then uh, endorsed just last month by the executive board of UNESCO. So this year, 
uh, we have a very busy year, very busy, busy year, because uh, during the period of October, November last year, I received 21 new applications. This is the most ever. Plus two applications from China for areas to be uh, to become uh, existing geoparks that were extending more than 10%. If you're going through an extension of more than 10%, you have to go through the whole application process again. So in total, we're looking at 23 areas this year. Uh, they've all gone through the intergovernmental check, which has been no problem. I've had all the reviews from IPGS, so more or less they're all through, or some we weren't so sure, but, but all the missions are now being organized. Uh, the names have been distributed to, to the area, so all that's being organized at the moment. So in addition to the 23 applications, there are 33 UNESCO Global Geoparks across the board undergoing revalidation. So this is a lot of work. So that means in total we have what is it, 56 different sets of uh, missions going on this year. So the council are going to have a lot of reports to read come September. The council will be meeting uh, in September early September at a conference in uh, Northern Italy, and I'll talk about a little bit about that just right at the end. Now, I just want to finish up by talking about economic value, because that's really what we're emphasizing about geoparks, that it's about economic development. So where's the evidence of this? This is a, story, this is a survey that was done by the NATCOM, the United Kingdom's National Commission, um, about five years ago now, so this was before the UNESCO Global Geopark label existed, but the label Global Geopark did, and so they included it. And you can see that this, this study was what is the value of UNESCO to the United Kingdom? How much money does UNESCO bring to the UK's economy? And they showed that all of the activities of UNESCO, everything, brought in over 89 million British pounds. But they broke it down into well, which brings most. And you can see that there were two things, two activities of UNESCO that by far and away brought in much, much more money to the British economy than anything else. World Heritage Sites and the Geoparks. The Geoparks were very surprised, pleasantly surprised, of course, about this. And then we did a bit of an analysis because the UK has got 28 World Heritage Sites, at least it did at the time the survey was. was Taken. So it showed on average, a World Heritage Site in the UK is bringing just over two million pounds to the local economy. But the UK has six and a half geoparks. You may wonder where the half comes from. It's between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. It's transnational. And so we were showing that you, that would demonstrate that on average, a geopark is bringing in almost three million pounds to to the British economy every year. Uh, they did another study just a year or two later, uh, changing the methodology, looking specifically at tourism, specifically at tourism, and it showed that um, uh, there was eight and a half million, it was over seven million of the income in geoparks was from tourism, uh, compared to 5,000 pounds from biosphere reserves. So that's seven million in geoparks, 5,000 in biosphere reserves. So it shows the different emphasis of these two labels. Another study was done this time in Portugal a few years ago. This is a list of uh, activities that people are paying for organized by the geopark. There's a stay in hotels, booking restaurants, going on geopark activities, whether it be uh, rafting, visiting museums, etc., etc. And they were able to demonstrate that every year Geopark activities are bringing in 15 million euro into the economy of northern Portugal. Now, a subsequent study in the geopark that I represented before joining UNESCO, one of the Irish geoparks, has come up with almost exactly the same figure for the Marble Arch Caves UNESCO Global Geopark. 15 million euro being brought in additional to the local economy. So, I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to uh, Strongly invite anybody who's interested to come to the 8th International Conference on UNESCO Global Geoparks. Uh, it will follow the meeting of the Council. It's in the Italian Alps, the geopark of Alto Melamenta. 
and uh, you can come and meet all of the UNESCO Global Geoparks. We meet every we, we meet as a group as a global network once every two years. So this year will be in September, and you can come and learn and, uh, and ask questions, share experience, get advice, um, and enjoy the beautiful alpine landscape of, of northern Italy. So I leave it, and of course I can't finish a UNESCO talk without talking about the Sustainable Development Goals. And just to let you know that uh, the International Geoscience and Geoparks Program supports many of them. Thank you.